So, yeah. Yeah. what do you think about the, I guess, African-American leadership then, as opposed to now, it's student leadership? Well, that's, that's such a good question. Um, I really, with the exception of what was going on at the Black Cultural Center, I don't really even remember any other African American leaders on campus, mm -hmm. particularly in a from an administrative side, if you will. Yeah. Um, there was Dr. Redman, yeah. there was Dr. McFadden, mm -hmm. there was uh, Ms. Brooks, mm -hmm. and that's what I remember. Then you have those those yeah, AD Baxter, AD Baxter, yeah, yeah AD, mm -hmm. yeah, AD who worked there, and I, and of course Ms. Melton. Ms. Melton wasn't there my first year or two. Yeah, Later, Milton, when yeah. she came, I mean, impactful, mm -hmm. impactful. Um, and then of course there were those adjunct faculty members here. There. Were, folks who, who may have been you know, professors, but again, as students, we saw them sitting in that Ivy Tower, yeah. and, or, the, uh, and, or Ivory Tower, and you couldn't just really, they were, they were you just couldn't approach them, but that's how we saw it, particularly as mm -hmm. freshmen and sophomores. So, um, I don't know, I don't know what, what leadership is like now on campus, um, I don't know if these are people that you feel a sense of, of, of community with or not, so I really can't address that, you know, today in terms of what leadership is like. I'll say this, uh, the young lady's name was Leslie Williams. Yeah, her name was Leslie Williams. She was a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. She had on, she had on like a, a body, body suit, tights, and she had a gaucho on. And she got hit and the gaucho was, you know, set up. So it made her look like she was a prostitute or something sleazy or whatever. That, that was that kind of thing. But for us, when we was coming up, the leadership came from us. We really didn't look to faculty to lead us. We was just doing stuff. You know, I, I remember like I was part of Black Culture Program Committee. I was part of different organizations, and really at the time when I got on campus, I saw the juniors and seniors as the leaders. I really didn't look yeah. at outside of Dr. Redman, AD, and a, like four or five. I didn't really look for the faculty to lead me anywhere. Hey, we didn't have a lot of black faculty. Like I mean, it's, it's a whole lot more now, but but we just looked at each other. So I, I followed the lead of the older students. Whether it was my RA, Sproul's Robert was my RA, you know, and he was one of the first persons that made an impression. My my RA made an impression how he carried himself. You know, this man was studious. He was about the books. He was an engineer. He was doing his thing, but he was cool. He wasn't up and he wasn't stuck up and that kind of thing. So we we saw the, the leadership in, amongst us. We just came with it. It's like, you know, when we came to school, a lot of the guys I came to school with already had it. You know that 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 y'all call it swagger. We call it confidence. Back in the day, we just had it. You know, it wasn't something we was looking for. That I think a lot of students nowadays is looking for it, but they betraying it as they have it. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a really distinct difference. And now I see a lot of black faculty. I don't. First of all, I see they have a disconnect. They're not together. And then they don't do enough for you all. In my my opinion, I think a lot of faculty members they got their positions. And that kind of thing, and you know, unless you know, if I'm a capital and you're a capital, then I might say some things to you. I'm a sigma, you know, whatever. It's not a thing where I'm concerned about you. You're in my classroom, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Now, I'm not saying all of them. I know a few of them that really get in there and care, but as a collective, I don't see that. You know, I think y'all had an in in uh, incident about a couple of years ago about noose in the tree. And mm -hmm. students got rowdy and stuff like that. People was upset. I don't know what happened as far as protests. But my whole thing of it is, is I don't want y'all to do what we did. I want y'all to do it better. I want you to be more effective. I don't want you to, because we protest and did all that stuff, and we was pissed off. But it'd been nice if we had some elders that said, okay, you protest then what? All right. What's your next thing? Yeah. Because you can't stop here. Once your emotions go, what's the next thing? Because somebody else is going to come behind him and <coughs> say something or do something to sure. disrespect you. We want to get it to where they don't disrespect people like that here anymore. So, yeah. so do you feel there's a similar apathy between the faculty and the students? Or where do you believe the disconnect actually originates from? Wow, the disconnect. That's a good one. I, I, again, I, I can't really speak effectively to situations on campus in terms of how faculty and students interact. But I do believe one of the keys to, to making this better is interaction between alumni and students, much like we're doing now. Whether you guys understand that we're building a relationship, we're building rapport with one another, we're building credibility. That, I think, is the key to closing that whole loop. Because you can be out there and not have, and I say out there in terms of being here on campus, uh, trying to navigate the duties of being a student, being in organizations, and you still have to be a person. And at some point, you're going to graduate and you're going to be an alumni. 
what does that look like? Then what do I do? What do I owe to university? I like to tell people I was raised in Memphis, but I grew up in Knoxville. <laughs> because it's, it's the experience that I had here on this campus that helped make me a man, helped formulate a lot of the things that I believe in today. And I had to do that on my own. You know, something as simple as having to wake yourself up and, 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 and iron your own clothes and wash your clothes, stuff you had somebody do for you in high school, but now you have to do that. But you still have to do other things. You have to, you know, manage your time, manage your money. So having people who've been there and done that, sort of like I was talking about with Reg. Reg just saying stuff to us when we were freshmen. You know, being, being open to that, being open to having somebody who is uh, currently working in, uh, in production who can talk to you periodically and talk about, well, you, you need to start getting your resume in shape to look like this, to do this. Someone who's been a photojournalist to talk about maybe you want to change your, your lens angle and just being receptive of that information and of that advice. And mm -hmm. I'm looking at it as something to destroy you, but something to build you up. And once you, once you receive that $5, the next time you turn around, you pay back $10 to the next young brother coming up. Mm -hmm. and you keep that loop going. Because there's so much information out there that we're just not privy to because either A, we don't want to listen, or B, we don't want to tell. Because it's, it's two-sided. There's some alum which is like, I got mine. Now you got to get yours. And that's not how it works. Because whether they want to admit it or not, somebody along the way opened the door. Yeah. You do not have a key to every locked door. You can't kick <laughs> open every door. Somebody would say, ah, come that's on, right, man, I got something for you. So, and, and that's important is understanding how to open doors. To see, or when you see to somebody's face and something, how, even if it's another one, just sit and have a conversation. Man, how you doing? What's going on with you? You know, th those things are important. I mean, it's about community. Mm -hmm. um, what sense did the, I mean, you spoke earlier about the Black Cultural Center. What purpose did the Black Cultural Center serve when you were here? Like, what <laughs> things were going on in the Black Cultural Family, Center? Because man. you said the leadership was here, yeah. so how was it when you was here? We, we, we just talked about you go ahead yeah. and say what you said. We said, I, we was talk, just talking about that. Well, well, I guess the first thing is just the way it looked, in my opinion. It was a house. I don't know if y'all have seen it. Is it still down there? It's still a house yeah, up so there. It looked it's like, so it looked like a house. It looked like you were going home, you walked in, and literally there were like some stairs right there. So yep. you were going up, then you run, hey, mom, hey, then you run upstairs to, you know, to your room or something. So, but it, it was very homey. Mm -hmm. And then it was always open. I remember, and I only do it now, there would be 24 hours, like during study uh, times where you can come and it's just open. And you can just, you kind of have free reign of it to come and mm -hmm. go. There are rooms you could go and study or meet or talk to people. And it was the one place, I would say, well, then there were, you know, there were two places that were just strictly for African Americans mm -hmm. on campus. Yeah. And you're like, you know, it's going to be some, some people there who look like me, walk like me, talk like me, can't relate to me, when I feel like I, I can't relate to anybody else in this big sea of orange and white. But I go and I say that somebody come in and say, hey, what's up, man? Mm -hmm. Well, y'all from Memphis, you know how we do it. So, <laughs> wait, you want to say, what's up, man?